Hello ladies, welcome back to um, 2nd Thessalonians. This is lesson 3 of 2nd Thessalonians and we're actually still in um, still in chapter 1. <laughs> um, and uh, I do have a lot of good stuff to cover today. But um, I'm just going to ask that you guys um, pray through <laughs> these lessons because for whatever reason, I've been really struggling to um, do the lessons in Second Thessalonians. And so maybe, um, you know, maybe there's something in here that God really wants to use and Satan doesn't want. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of hoping that's what it is, but you know, like we've been, um, let's see, I had to put the Bible studies on hold for a little while. And then, um, when we finally got back, I've been actually struggling to just get the lessons, um, finalized and, um, and then um, we're, um, and then my com my computer stopped working. Actually, um, all of my devices, um, my phone, my watch, and my computer. They tried to do this big update that apparently they weren't ready for and um, so they all stopped working and I had to get them fixed and so um, it's just been kind of a crazy struggle and I don't even, you know, know why it, why it's been so hard just to get it out there but it has been so hopefully. <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> Hopefully, um, you all get something from the lesson. So let's go ahead and pray and get started. Dear Lord, I pray that you will give me the words to say as I do this lesson, help it to be from you, speak to somebody's heart, um, and just, um, help these lessons to be a blessing to somebody and, uh, just help um, each video to um, to be directly from you um, because it is because we're studying your word and we don't um, we know that we know that um, you use your word to change lives and I just pray that you'll be with each person who listens to this lesson and be with me as I teach it in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So, we are in 2nd Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1 says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus and to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um and last week we uh, went over the things that Christians should do. Um, we didn't get through the whole list, but uh, we got through some, you know, some interesting things here in this chapter. Uh, but today we're going back to the um, outline of the chapter. And... Um, First of all, um, from F.B. Meyer, <laughs> um, I got some couplets from this chapter. Um, so it says, he said, notice the remarkable couplets. And so we're, I want to look at those real quick. So in verse 2, 2 Thessalonians 1, 2, it says, Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first couplet is grace and peace. Grace and peace. 
And then verse 3 says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Um, so we have faith and love, because um, most of you know that the charity that it's talking about here is um, the Christian's expression of love. And so, um, so in, yeah, so in that verse we see the faith growing and the charity abounding. So faith and love. And then verse four um, has tribulation for those who trouble and rest for those who are troubled. So there's um, tribulation for, um, for those who trouble and rest for those who are troubled. Um, and then we'll go to verse six. Verse 6 says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Okay, so... Oh, okay, so I... I'm sorry. Uh, the tribu... I thought that was wrong. Okay, so the tribulation for those who trouble and rest for those who are troubled is verses 6 and 7. Okay, <laughs> So that makes sense now that um, I read verse 6. Verse 4 was actually faith and patience. So um, 3 is faith and love, and 4 is faith and patience. And then um, 6 and 7 is tribulation for those who trouble and rest for those who are troubled. And then verse 8 is, it talks about know not and obey not. And verse 9 talks about the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Verse 9 says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? So the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. And then verse, uh, verse 10 talks about glorified and admired. Um, it says, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because of because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So um, he is glorified and admired. And verse 11 says, wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you... Hang on. Searching. That's enough. No. Thank you. Okay. So, um, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith, faith with power. So, verse 11 is the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith. Okay, so um, F.B. Meyer said, like mirrors that face each other, these words flash back and forth their depths of sacred significance. The future contains rest for the weary, palms of victory for the defeated, glory for the name and cause of Christ, and above all, the revelation of that dear presence with which we have been so constantly in touch. The final prayer has always been highly prized by God's people. His being glorified and admired in his saints is not a far-off event, but one with the possibilities of the present hour, and the name of Jesus may be, may be magnified here and now. Sorry, the name of Jesus may be magnified here and now in us, as it will be finally and more perfectly. Okay, and 2 Thessalonians 1, 
10 says, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. And verse 12 says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, Jesus is magnified through us as believers. Um, so here in 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter is basically a pastoral encouragement and um, he is in, Paul, Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians that they could su successfully, I can't talk tonight, guys. <laughs> they could successfully endure the tribulation of man. Dr. Charles Ryrie states that this verb groweth exceedingly. Um... Sorry, that's in verse... Uh, I meant to put a verse with that. Okay, um, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for, your, for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. So, um, Dr. Charles Ryrie states that this verb, groweth exceedingly, is a very strong compound one found only here in the New Testament and indicates organic growth as of a, a healthy plant. Um, so our faith is to grow like a healthy plant grows. All right, this tribulation had helped them increase their steadfastness or their patience. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 says, um, I'm going to read 4 and 5, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token, token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. So, um... So they were glorying in the patience and faith that they had in the persecutions and tribulations um, that they had to endure. So basically, when trials come, we can rejoice in the fact that God is strengthening our patience and faith. Um, so, you know, they say don't pray for patience because then God will send you a trial <laughs> to strengthen your patience. And it's true that we don't want the trials. We, as, as um, human beings, we dread those. But um, we do want to grow more and more like Christ. And that is um, what God is working in us. And so we... Um, we do rejoice in that. And um, let's see, we, we rejoice in our um, spiritual growth as we go through those trials. And then Romans 5.3, and I'm going to read um, verses 2 through 4, actually. So Romans chapter 5, verse 2 says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So the reason we rejoice in tribulation is because tribulation brings patience and we rejoice in patience because patience um, brings 
experience <laughs> and we rejoice in the experience because that brings hope. Um, when we don't see God working in our earthly trials, then we don't see, we don't, um, we don't see the hope that is ours um, as we press towards um, towards heaven. <laughs> we don't um, live that and experience that when we're not seeing how God is working in our trials. Or, um, or I should say trusting that he is working in our trials. Sometimes it's hard to see at the moment, at the time that it's happening, but um, we can always trust that he is working through it. All right, so um, this tribulation would bring glory to Christ. Second Thessalonians uh, one twelve, we actually already read that so um, I'm not going to read it again but the purpose of the tribulation is to bring glory to Christ um, in a book called the Thessalonian epistles it says this is an expression often used but perhaps not always analyzed or understood as it should be the scriptures state the heavens declare that God is perfect. The heavens manifest his wisdom, his power, and his intelligent end. The heavens are manifesting the glory of God in the sense that they reveal what God is and what he can do. But the heavens are not designed to re reveal the love of God, the grace of God, nor the righteousness of God. That is where Christians come into the picture. We are designed to show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ. Okay, so um, we often say that the trial um, brings glory to God, but we don't often stop and think about that. Um, but the, the Bible says that the heavens declare um, God's holiness. The heavens declare that God is perfect. Um, so when we look at nature, when we look at the stars, when we look at um, the sky, we can see God's wisdom, his power, and his intelligence. Um, and we can see God's glory in that sense. Um, we can see all the wonderful things that God can do. His, the, how, you know, the things that he was able to create. But when we look at God's creation, when we look at nature, we don't necessi necessarily see God's love and grace and righteousness. Um, we see that through God's people. And so, I mean, in a sense, we could see God's love. We can see that, um, you know, God keeps things going even when he doesn't have to. <laughs> um, and God provides in nature what we need to survive. Um, but really, you know, that's not how nature directs a person to God. The main way that nature um, directs people to God is by showing God's power um, and God's intelligence, his, his design. Um, but, but the thing that is really going to um, 
guide someone to the foot of the cross is by seeing through Christians God's love. Such a that's enough. So seeing through Christians God's love and grace and even righteousness. They, they can look at us and see that we are different. And, um, you know, there comes a point in people's lives when they want something different, when they realize that what they have is not enough. And so um, that's when hopefully they will think of a Christian that they know. Um, and so God has chosen to use human beings to spread the gospel and um, his main way of doing that is by filling us with his love and grace and righteousness um, so that so that we can be a testimony to others and um, and so Ephesians 2, 7, let's um, look at verses 6 through 8. So Ephesians 2, 6 says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So, you know, um, our testimony is not just a blessing um, on this earth. It is very important on this earth, but it doesn't end there. It is throughout the ages. It says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So um, through, throughout eternity, we're going to, um, God, God is going to be able to show his glory through us, through what he did for us to change us and to make us like him. Which is pretty amazing to think about. <laughs> so, um, so then we also see the time of this tribulation in Second Thessalonians one seven. So, verse seven says, "And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels." So, um, so we might be troubled now, but when the, when the Lord is revealed, we'll be able to rest. Um, and I think, um, spiritually speaking, we have rest now. We can rest in him. We can, um, trust in him and our spirit can rest because we have a peace that passes understanding. We know um, that he is working in our lives and that he will see us through. So in that sense, we can have rest even in the midst of the trial. But, you know, on this earth, we don't get complete rest. Um, but when Christ comes back, we will have that complete rest. And, um, and then we see the nature of this tribulation in 2 Thessalonians 1.8. So verse 8 says, In flaming fire, <clears throat> taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, 
so it's um okay so this verse is actually talking about tribulation towards those who aren't saved and um and this passage does kind of um it goes back and forth between the two the um tribulation of the christians and the um the wrath of god towards the unrighteous um and so that is a pretty strong um pretty strong wrath and it's because um it's because God is holy and he can't have sin in his presence. But let's see. It says, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. So them that know not God uh, in the Wilmington's Guide to the Bible, it says, these are probably those who may never have heard the spoken gospel, but did have both the witness of conscience and nature and are therefore without excuse. Um, when God's wrath comes, there is no excuse because um, God tells us that the, that those who respond to um, what he has shown them, he will reveal um, more. And I firmly believe that if someone is um, is seeking God, they will find him. And uh, so, so it's not because they never had an opportunity. It's because they, um, they refused to respond to the opportunity to turn to God. Romans 1, 18 through 20. Um, and I don't want, <laughs> I don't want y'all to get the, the idea that that means that we don't have the responsibility of telling people because we do and we never know um you know how much more somebody needs to respond um well it's like this they have the responsibility of responding but we have the responsibility of telling so on each of us there is a responsibility and we need to um we have, we will be held accountable for our responsibility. And so I'm not responsible uh, for the way people respond to the gospel, but I am responsible for the people that I, um, or for, let's see, I am responsible for the times that I didn't that I didn't respond to the Holy Spirit to tell somebody about the gospel or to um, invite somebody to church or to just say a kind word. Um, I'm responsible for um, obeying the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And then the, and then God, um, can use someone else to bring the gospel into that person's life, but then I won't have the blessing that would have come if I had done it myself. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so Romans 1, 18 through 20 um, says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Um, so there it is. The wrath of God is against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Um, they, they have the truth, but they continue in unrighteousness. And um, and God is manifest in them. God shows himself to them. Um, and if in no other way he shows it to them, shows himself to them through creation. Um, he, so, yeah, so they're left without excuse when, um, when they say, well, nobody ever told me, God told them, God showed them his reality through creation. And, um, if they respond to that, then he will certainly bring someone to tell them more um yeah so that's the way that's the way i uh let's see the way i the way i see it is what i was gonna say but that's the way i believe that um god works in people's lives those who have never heard okay Romans 2, 12 through 16, let's actually start with verse 11. Romans 2, 11 says, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned 